Hello everyone. Today I want to talk about high mass stars. Uh, we want to contrast that with low mass stars we talked about last time. Uh, the main difference is that high mass stars have a higher mass and that's going to determine the end result of the uh, of the object that they become. The life cycle stages are going to be similar in that we're going to have a formation stage, we'll live on the main sequence for a time, and then the, we, they will evolve off the main sequence into an evolved object. But the types of physical reactions that occur and what happens inside the star is fundamentally different. Also, high mass stars explode catastrophically, so that makes them fundamentally interesting. Okay, before we go on, let's remind ourselves what we mean by being a star. Remember, a star is a round ball of hot uh, gas that is held together by gravity and held apart by radiation pressure inside from fusion processes, and that makes it roughly imbalanced so that for the life cycle of the star, it stays a round ball uh, that produces energy uh, throughout its life cycle. Now, uh, the way we produce energy inside of a star when we're talking about fusing hydrogen to helium is something called the proton-proton chain. Now the proton-proton chain is a chain reaction that allows four hydrogen atoms to form fuse into one helium atom. And we need four hydrogen atoms because a helium atom consists of two protons and two neutrons. Four hydrogen atoms consist of four protons, and the process of fusing those together uh, reduces the final result, uh, the mass of the final result by a little bit, and releases energy when that happens. And that energy released is the stuff that uh, eventually shines out of the surface of the sun. The problem is, is that four protons hitting together is a really unlikely scenario. I mean, if you imagine uh, a car accident at an intersection where you have four cars all running the stop sign simultaneously and smashing into each other, uh, that's a very unlikely event. You could, you could have cars drive that intersection and not stop at the stop sign uh, a thousand times and they would maybe you'd have two of them hit, maybe none of them would hit, maybe sometimes three of them would hit, but the chances of all four hitting in exactly the same spot is pretty rare. Uh, that's even more so in the sun with hydrogen atoms because the hydrogen uh, nucleus is so small that the chances of them interacting are very weak. So what we need to do is have a system that builds up on a number of different interactions that results in the same thing where we get four hydrogen going to one helium and the release of energy. And that's something we call the proton-proton chain. So I've got a picture of that here, four hydrogen nuclei, so these are basically four protons, and the chances of any two of those nuclei hitting is pretty good because the density at the center of the star is so high. So we get two of them hit and they form what's called a deuteron and this is a, a hydrogen atom. It's a hydrogen atom because it only has one proton but it also has one of the protons from the collision has turned into a neutron and that gives it a more mass than a typical hydrogen atom so we call it a deuteron. And it's, a, it's a hydrogen atom with a proton and a neutron. And the same thing happens to this one and this one and this one so we wind up with two of of these deuterons. Those chances of those deuterons hitting another proton are pretty good. So here's an interaction with another proton. Those things hit. When they hit, they produce energy in the form of gamma rays and form what's known as a helium-3 nucleus. Now helium-3 is helium because it has two protons, but it also only has one neutron. So it's a helium atom with only three subatomic particles inside of the atom. That happens again over here, producing more energy and another helium-3, and then we wind up with eventually the heliums hit and collide, produce uh, uh, an interaction which results in two protons flying off to be part of other reactions later, and a helium-4 nucleus, stable helium-4 nucleus at the end. Now the reason this is uh, important is because four hydrogen uh, nuclei going into one helium nuclei, if you look up the mass of four hydrogen, they're greater than the mass of one helium, right? So we've lost mass. We've had mass loss in this interaction. And because we know that mass and energy can be related with Einstein's E equals mc squared, any mass loss is the same as energy loss, or in this case, energy produced from the reaction that goes flying off through the star into space, eventually to intersect our planet, where we can do photosynthesis and build solar panels and produce energy. So that's the proton-proton chain, and that's how typical stars, mainly low-mass stars or early-type stars that only have hydrogen and helium work.
Now in high mass stars, however, especially high mass stars that are enriched in things like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, there's a more efficient way to produce this energy. The result is the same. You wind up taking four protons and turning them into one helium. But because you've got uh, higher pressures and temperatures inside, there's a more efficient reaction. And that reaction is called the CNO cycle. And the CNO cycle uh, is simply a, a, a catalyst cycle that again takes four protons, turns them into one helium atom, but it uses carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as a, as a catalyst of the reaction. So if we look at this, step one is we have a hydrogen atom comes in and hits one of the carbon atoms in the core. Now if there are no carbon atoms in the core, this cycle is not going to work. You have to go back to proton, proton. But in the carbon uh, CNO cycle, if carbon is present, this is a more efficient reaction. So when this happens, a helium a hydrogen nucleus will hit a carbon nucleus and it will release energy in the form of radiation. It will result in a nitrogen nucleus. Now that's because we've taken that proton and put it in carbon and if you have an extra proton on carbon, that's what we call nitrogen. Uh, that uh, decays by a process of atomic decay that turns back into a carbon-13 and releases uh, a positron and a neutrino. Right, So these are other little subatomic particles that go flying off into space. Uh, that carbon-13 hits a another proton, which turns into a stable nitrogen-14, releasing energy. That stable nitrogen-14 interacts with another proton, releasing energy and turning into an unstable oxygen atom, oxygen-15. That oxygen-15 uh, decays, emitting positrons and neutrinos interacting uh, to become a uh, nitrogen-15, which interacts with a hydrogen atom, and that releases back to a carbon atom and one helium atom. Okay, So the total reaction, if I look at the whole thing, is four protons, one, two, three, four, big messy complex reaction involving CNO, one helium atom. So the result is the same. Now you might ask yourself, how do we know which process is going on? We can't go into the center of the star and see what's going on there, so how do we know which process is going on? And the key is the release of these subatomic particles, right? These proton, these positrons and neutrinos, in particular neutrinos. If I go back to our uh, previous cycle with the proton-proton cycle, we can look and see how many, uh, what, how many and how often neutrinos are released. So we got uh, a uh, release of a positron here, that's one, and we have a new neutrino here, one, positron here, one, neutrino here, one, and they have a particular energy spectrum. Okay, now if I go back to our, our other interaction, we have again two areas where we release positrons and neutrinos. We've got here and here, and we have here and here, but because of the process that's going on here, they're going to have a different energy spectrum. They'll have different energies uh, because of the different reactions going on. And so by looking at the energies of the, of the neutrinos in particular that come out of the sun, we can determine which processes are occurring. Now, of course, these were determined theoretically first. We predicted that they would be in there, and then we went off and, and observed these things happening. So again, the, the end result is the same. Hydrogen fusing into helium. Four star on the main sequence. That's what we call the main sequence. Stars on the main sequence fuse hydrogen into helium. But once that hydrogen and helium is, or that hydrogen is exhausted, right? We have uh, we have to uh, uh, have the star begin to collapse because we no longer have enough energy being produced in the core to hold it up against its own gravity. The star is going to collapse, and that's going to result in a chain reaction of other elements fusing into higher elements. Okay, so we start with hydrogen core fusion. That's main sequence, as we call main sequence. Uh, once the hydrogen is gone from the core, the core collapses. Remember, at the same time, the outer atmosphere pushes out because it's getting further from this core, so the gravity is less for this outer shell. It moves out. Uh, the star becomes what we call a supergiant, and we have helium now burning in the core, but because the core is now smaller, more hydrogen has moved closer in where the pressure and temperature are higher so that uh, we can get this hydrogen shell burning. And this is exactly what we saw uh, from the low mass stars. Right? Low mass stars would get this uh, end of hi hydrogen core fusion, and they would have hydrogen shell burning and helium core fusion. Okay?
Uh, the difference is, is where we can go with the elements. Because you'll recall that for low mass stars, we could go as high as carbon, and then there just wasn't enough mass to fuse anymore. And it would slough off into a planetary nebula, and we would be left, up with a, left off with the atmosphere of the star and a, and a white dwarf. But because we have more mass now, we can fuse to higher elements. The temperature and pressure in the star are high enough that you can fuse to heavier elements. So if we look at the periodic table of the elements, um, the, the universe started with about 75% uh, hydrogen by mass uh, and 25% helium. So most stars were hydrogen and helium. Actually, all stars to begin with were all hydrogen and helium. And that's what we need uh, to make everything else. So at first of all, if we go to helium fusion in low mass stars, we can get carbon. Carbon is, uh, uh, it results from fusing helium in the core of low mass stars. That's the carbon in your body. That's where it comes from. Uh, once we make carbon, we can uh, fuse in, we can make in some stars carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, because if you take a carbon atom and huck a, uh, uh, a proton on there, you're going to get nitrogen. If you huck a proton on nitrogen, you're going to get oxygen. And so we make CNO. Uh, that can be used as the catalyst in high mass stars for the CNO cycle. Once we get to that, uh, we can use a process called helium capture, which takes a carbon atom, captures a helium, an oxygen atom captures a helium, a neon atom captures a helium, and it marches up the periodic table in groups of four. Right? So if we look at this, um, helium capture uh, builds carbon into oxygen, right? so we can capture carbon and one helium that's going to take us all the way up to oxygen because we have two protons here and we have six protons here so we move up to eight protons that's oxygen if i capture another helium nucleus it's going to take me to neon because i've got two plus eight is ten i can capture another ten up to magnesium and i can just keep on going up the line until i can get to uh, very very high mass stars can fuse elements all the way up to iron now, how far we march up this periodic table of the element depends on the mass of the star, because you can see that, um, you know, if I if I have enough mass to increase the pressure and temperature, I can keep doing this process. I can go from 12 to 14, 14 to 16, 16 to 20, all the way up to 26, which is iron. Now, why does it stop at iron? It stops at iron because iron is the atom where it now takes more energy to fuse them together than you get out. Every other fusion process we just talked about is something called exothermic, which means that the, uh, the amount of energy you get out of the reaction is greater than the amount of energy you put in. So it's a net production of energy. When we get to iron, that's no longer the case. You put energy in to fuse it, and, and, you, and it releases less energy than you put in. That's called an endothermic reaction. So what's interesting, though, from a stellar perspective is not only does this make everything up to iron, but it also creates this sort of onion skin uh, model of, of the star because the core is going to be fusing the heaviest element that's currently being fused. The little shell on the outside will do the next heaviest. The little shell on the outside of that will do the next heaviest all the way out until you get to uh, hydrogen shell burning and then non-hydrogen shell burning uh, or hydrogen inert gas on the outside. Uh, eventually this will go to where you have an inert iron core, but you still have this shell burning. So this is going to cause a number of pulsations in the star. It's going to cause uh, uh, different elements to fuse at different times. And we get this sort of onion layer model where eventually the core inside is inert. right? But once the core goes inert, these shells start to burn up and burn up and burn up. And eventually that amount of energy is going to go down until you don't have enough energy to hold up the star any longer. Um, now, we talked about iron as being the, uh, the, the kind of place where this occurs, where this uh, fusion reaction gives over to a fission reaction, or exothermic gives off uh, to fission reactions. Uh, if I look at this diagram here, this is just looking at the mass per nuclear particle, right? So in the case of hydrogen, it's one hydrogen atom divided by the mass of the hydrogen atom, so that's pretty high. As I go to higher numbers of atomic masses, I have to put more particles in there to keep the atom stable, so this goes down, right? So the mass per particle, uh, the mass per nuclear particle goes down until I get to the point where I have iron right here, and then it starts to go up again. So in this case, fission releases energy. That's when we go from a higher atomic number to a lower atomic number. Here, fusion releases energy, where you go from a lower atomic number to a higher atomic number. And where that bottoms out is iron. So this is the place where no more fusion. No fusion for you right here. <laughs>
because you wouldn't get any energy out if you did it. Okay. Um, now, if you look at how we, we talked about how we get these helium capture atoms, um, that, uh, if that process is occurring, what we should see is that the abundances of atoms that are multiples of four, uh, or at least, sorry, if you're, if, sorry, if you're a, the abundances of atoms that have, uh, that lie on this helium capture cycle where you're adding two protons and two neutrons each time you capture, uh, a helium nucleus, we should see increased abundances of those elements if that's what's occurring. So, for example, uh, we have helium, that's helium capture because it's by itself. The next one up would be carbon, capture a helium and you get oxygen, capture a helium and you get neon, capture a helium you get magnesium, capture a helium you get silicon, capture a uh, helium you get sulfur, argon, calcium, Oh, what's this guy right here? Well, they're still slightly abundant up to iron, right? So again, we do see that there's a kind of distribution where we get more of these higher abundances of even numbers of protons, okay? And that's even true, even though this even number is lower than this one, it's higher than the odd numbers around it. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the formation process of the, of the elements that are going on inside the stars. This gets us all the way up to iron. The problem is, is that there's a lot of stuff in the universe that's heavier than iron. So the question is, where does it come from? And the answer is, it comes from the catastrophic explosion that is a supernova explosion from a high-mass star. That's the picture you're seeing right here. This is a supernova explosion. We'll come back and see this a little bit later. But this is where the rest of the elements in the universe are formed. Got a little simulation here for you to kind of show uh, this model we've been talking about to see what happens. So let's start with, uh, again, this is like what we saw for our sun-like sun star, but we're going to look at this from space. Uh, this is a picture of what this star looks like, and this is telling you what's going on inside of the high-mass star. So let's go ahead and run this. You see that as we start to run out of hy hydrogen in the core uh, and helium in the core, the star expands into the red giant a little bit. We now have a carbon uh, a carbon core. Uh, now it's going to have oxygen as we uh, fuse from carbon into oxygen. Then we're going to get uh, red giant phase is going to pulsate a little bit as we run out of that oxygen. We're going to start to fuse uh, neon, right? And then we're going to have magnesium and we're going to have silicon and it's going to keep on doing that all the way up to iron. And you get this sort of onion shell model. So now we've got our inert iron core and all of these shells. Now this puts the star in a very unstable condition because every single time you run out of one of these new fuels, things start to go a little bit wonky. So if you uh, watch to see what happens here, we have now a core which is no longer producing energy and a bunch of shells that are producing a little bit of energy. So what's going to happen when I run this is that eventually gravity is going to take over and it's going to beat out all of the radiation that's coming from that and that's going to result in a collapse. And there we have a supernova. Now, you might ask yourself, how does something collapsing result in an explosion? Well, if you think about it, if I have one half of a giant star eight solar mass star and one half of an eight solar mass star over here and they're falling towards each other towards an inert iron core eventually they're going to hit and bounce off each other causing a giant explosion and a black hole or a neutron star left over okay so let's uh, you know look at uh, what can form when these things happen. Um, we talked a little bit about degeneracy pressure with supernova. That just meant that you packed everything so tightly together that it couldn't get any smaller, right? And that was the pressure from that, uh, from that tight packing of the atoms is what caused the star to keep up. But if you have more and more mass, even that can't hold the core uh, back from further collapse, right? So what happens is that the electrons combine with protons to form what's called a neutron. And a neutron, if you do that for the entire mass of the star, becomes a neutron star. And that's, uh, the, that means that you basically have a stellar mass of material that has the density of an atomic nucleus. Now again, degeneracy pressure takes over at this point because if you don't have enough mass to compress the neutrons anymore, they have enough, uh, enough degeneracy pressure just from the tight packing of the neutrons to hold themselves together. Um, all of the stuff that blows apart when this happens, all the way up uh, to uh, uranium, which is the last naturally occurring element on our periodic table of the elements, is formed during this giant explosion. And that includes uh, all the gold in the universe, right? So if you have a, happen to have a gold ring, pull this thing out, this gold ring, this is 
from a supernova explosion. So you have a little bit of a supernova explosion on your finger if you happen to be married or have a ring. Um, if you happen to use nuclear power, that all comes from a supernova explosion. So every time I look at uh, you know, a piece of gold jewelry or something, I think, hey, cool, a little fossilized uh, stellar explosion. Okay, so the other cool thing about these things is they're incredibly bright and incredibly visible. So the, uh, the, a particular supernova explosion can outshine the entire galaxy. And uh, the, the Crab Nebula, which is, this is a picture of the Crab Nebula right here, uh, exploded in 1054 AD, and it was written down by Chinese astronomers, and they identified where it is in the sky. So we went back and found this with modern telescopes, and because we know that they observed it here in 1054 AD, and we observed it out here, you know, in 2013 or 2014. And if we know the velocity of the gas, which we can measure spectroscopically, you can figure out the extent of this thing uh, just by how long it's taken to grow uh, into its size. So it's a neat thing that we can go out and sort of see these explosions because this explosion is still ongoing. It's been, you know, what, uh, almost a thousand years and it's still this explosion that's shooting out into space. And we can see that happen in real time. Uh, just to show you, uh, the closest supernova in the last four centuries was 1987A, which uh, is uh, shown right here. You can see that this was in the small, the, it was a large Magellanic cloud, and you can see the uh, supernova here is outshining this whole, this whole grouping of, of stars. Um, here's a, a picture of it up close. And you can see that it has these rings that have expanded from it. It has an inner ring of material blasting off. So clearly these, uh, these explosions can be really diverse in their shapes because it just depends on the type of system uh, that, occur that it occurred in when the explosion uh, finally went off. Um, we have been able to detect uh, lots of uh, changes in this as we look at most, more, more recent observations. Um, you can see here uh, observations in visible light, observations in x-rays and radio waves, and this is showing <laughs> the, the uh, debris crashing into material in real time. So again, these are explosions. It's like watching a slow motion train wreck. Uh, we can just watch it occur over thousands, uh, over, over decades. And the reason for that is because the space involved is so high that this material is just flying out, flying out, and we can watch it happen in real time. Okay, so we've talked about low mass stars, what happens in their cores. We've talked about high mass stars, what happens in their cores. We've talked a little bit about the life cycles and the results. I just want to summarize this because this is a really important part of, of stellar astronomy is understanding uh, how we've gotten to this, uh, this level of understanding. So this diagram here, you're looking on the left hand side, this is a uh, high mass star. I think it says a 25 solar mass star. The one on the right is a one solar mass star. And this just is schematically showing you that the, uh, the results of, of the cycle, the end result is radically different, but there are some similarities in between uh, the two types. So let's take a look at these things. First of all, why does mass matter? Mass matters because it determines the core temperature. It determines uh, the lifetime. So if you have a very high massive star, you have a, high li a short lifetime. If you have a low mass star, you have long lived uh, stars. Uh, and then uh, we the, the mass also determines the final outcome, whether or not we wind up as a white dwarf or whether we wind up as a uh, black hole or a neutron star. So here's the summary for low mass stars. Uh, low mass stars start on the main sequence, fusing hydrogen into helium via the proton-proton chain. Let me just make a note of that. So this is the, the PP chain. We don't have enough high temperature areas to use the CNO cycle. Once that hydrogen runs out, we turn into a red giant because the core collapses, the atmosphere is further away from the core, the gravity is reduced, and the radiation pushes the atmosphere out. So the atmosphere gets bigger, core gets smaller. We wind up uh, uh, using uh, the helium now to fuse helium uh, in the core. That helium in the core fuses up to carbon, and that carbon winds up being an inert planetary nebula with a white dwarf left behind. So that's the, the low mass star summary. High mass stars, uh, whoops, uh, high mass stars, they, uh, the, the, they do fuse hydrogen into helium on their main sequence, just like we uh, talked about, but they do it through the CNO cycle rather than the PP chain. They'd still enter a red giant phase uh, where they fuse hydrogen in the core, he hydrogen to helium and helium into carbon. Uh, the difference is, is that because we have a 
high mass star, it goes beyond carbon, it fuses many, many elements, you get these pulsations, and finally, when all you have is iron left in the core, it collapses, rebounds, explodes, and you wind up with a giant explosion uh, of a supernova. Okay, last thing to show you here. And just as a reminder, the reasons for these life stages, the core shrinks and heats until it's uh, hot enough for more fusion. Uh, the nuclei with larger charge require higher temperatures, so that's why you have to have the higher mass stars in order to get uh, to fuse to heavier elements. Uh, the core thermostat is broken when the core is not hot enough for fusion. So anytime you wind up with an inert material in the core, the star is going to shrink the core is going to shrink until it heats up that temperature to, to kickstart the fusion again, if at all possible. And fusion can't happen if degeneracy pressure keeps the core from shrinking. So that means if we get to a white dwarf or we get to a neutron star, uh, the pressure from the compactness of those objects can't uh, help you. And so they, or, or I should, the pressure from the compactness of those objects hurts you and it makes it so that you can't uh, compress anymore to increase the temperature and that's when you wind up with your final object.